I think one of the things that happens for us when we're highly competent is that because we're so competent, it doesn't occur to us to delegate. And and entangled in that also was, is someone going to do this the way I want? You are listening to Amplify Your Success Podcast, episode 337. And today we're going to learn how to unlock our prosperity code to reach eight figures. You ready for this? Let's get started. Welcome to the Amplify Your Success Podcast. Get ready to ramp up your revenue, amplify your impact, and make your mark in the world. This is the show for experts, thought leaders, and service professionals who want to shatter their limits and achieve that next level. You're going to find out from other experts and influencers how they made it. Now, let's get Amplified. Hey there, inspired entrepreneurs and business leaders. It's your host, Melanie Benson, authority amplifier and possibility igniter for expert-based entrepreneurs just like you. And I, I'm just so, I'm so moved by our guest today. Oof, what an amazing, powerful conversation. And what I love the most about it is all that we're talking about, whether it's a six-figure goal, seven-figure goal, eight-figure goal for your business, or no goal at all, but you're just impact-driven, our guest today moved financial mountains by shifting her relationship with money, by rewiring her own prosperity code. And so it's just exquisite. I can't wait to share it with you. And along these same lines of our prosperity code, we also have a a way we relate to our authority. Okay, so we relate to money a certain way. It comes from our patterns. We relate to our expertise in a certain way. And the way we relate to that uh, part of us, that, that we have a superpower and how we share it and how we honor it, how we shine a light on it and amplify it, is affecting our income. It's affecting our client enrollments. I developed a quiz to help you see how well your authority is positioned to help you monetize your superpower. And I'd love for you to take it. There's some light bulb moments ready for you in it. If you go to melaniebenson.com forward slash authority quiz, you'll get to take the quiz and discover for yourself if your way that you showcase your authority is being leveraged properly so that other people get what your superpower is and how you can help them solve their problems. And they're going to want to work with you. Again, head over to melaniebenson.com forward slash authority quiz and take the quiz today. Now let's get into today's episode. Welcome back, Amplifiers. I'm so excited for our conversation today. We're talking with Jennifer Longmore, and we're going to unpack the lessons from building an eight-figure spiritual training school. Now, let me give Jennifer an official introduction. She's the founder of the number one Akashic Record training school in the world, has built a thriving eight-figure business around all things consciousness. She is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and board advisor to various conscious apps as she prepares them to trade publicly. When she's not coaching thousands of conscious entrepreneurs to create six and seven figure businesses doing what they love, you can find her hiking with her family, mining for crystals with her son, or enjoying martial arts with her husband. Welcome, Jennifer. This is uh, exciting you. times to be able to have this conversation. I know. Um, I'm also really fascinated by the transformation that occurs for somebody when they run a eight figure business, especially a spiritual training business. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know you do Akashic record training. Uh, tell me like, what was the spark for that in your life? How did that emerge? I just thought I was going to do readings at the time that I was uh, teaching a cash. Well, at the time I was only doing readings and I was teaching Reiki and doing like manifestation classes and so on. And people really enjoyed how they felt after readings because it's like a homecoming, right? You're connecting with your soul. It's a very deep soulful thing. And so people kept asking me to teach them. And I kept saying no, because I thought, well, I'm not qualified to teach them. Nobody's giving me an official permission slip to be able to create a certification program. Right. And some people got mad at me. They thought I was trying to hoard information and so on. And that's just my educational background. I used to work as a forensic investigator. So I'm used to having a certain standard of care as far as 
you know, who's qualified to, you know, give counseling as an example or who's qualified. And I, I just was used to the academic sort of track of, of being able to say, yes, I'm allowed to teach this to you now. But then when I tuned in, I realized, oh, yeah, I guess I can create this. And so I said, well, if I teach you this, what do you want to learn? So I created a level one, which was to teach them how they could do it themselves. And then at the end of the class, they said, when's, when's level two? And I said, there is no level two. And they said, well, we're going to need you to create it, basically. And so same thing happened. At the end of level two, they said, when's level three? And I said, oh, my goodness, like, what else do you need to learn? Right. In a playful way. And then after level three, they said, when's level four? And I said, no, this is all you need to be competent at reading people. And so I I turned Akashic Record level four into like an annual conference. And I would bring them all together. And it was like a skill sharpening sort of uh, conference every year with new themes and stuff. And so that was almost 20 years ago, which is hard to imagine. And, um, but it was never part of my plan, right? It was, it was other people. And I don't know if you've had this, Melanie, right? Where it, it's often like my best creations are, are when people ask me to teach something. I don't even, I'm not even aware, right? It, anytime I try to create something from, hey, this sounds like a good idea. It doesn't land the same as when people, you know, ask me to, to create it. Yeah, I have had that several times and it's the accidental success, right? You mm -hmm. respond to the need versus like try to create something out of your own head. So I, I totally get that one. Mm -hmm. So really it, it evolved as you attracted people who wanted to learn from you. Yeah. And it was built with duct tape, like many of our businesses <laughs> and many of our programs. And even now, I still kind of tune into it. I go, oh, that's a little bit duct tapey. Let's let's replace that with Gorilla Glue. I'd like that to be a little more solid, you know. Uh, but yeah, it was that was never part of my plan, although I'm super grateful for it. I just I, I think, you know, for many of us, when we leave our our J.O.B.s and start a business, we still I think I was just grateful that I was getting to do what I love. And the fact that people were paying me on top of that was just an added bonus, right? I just loved it anyways. And I loved that I could replace an income doing what I love because I really just, I thought, well, who's going to hire a Reiki master? I still was in the lens of getting a job at that time when I started my business to then be able to create my own economy. But I think, I don't know at, at what stage you were at in your business. I think I was probably seven or eight years in before I was like, oh yeah, I don't have to have a backup plan. Like I don't <laughs> have to worry about going and getting a job. Mm, I never had a backup plan. <laughs> no. I was all in, burn the bridge. I'm not going back and it was do or die. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I, th I, I probably fantasized a couple of times like, okay, well, would it be better if I just got a job? And I was like, I am so unemployable. This is never happening. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think for me, it wasn't a backup plan. It was, yeah, I got to do this. So I mm -hmm. had a little bit different um, driver, I think there. Yeah. You know, so here's one of the things I'm so curious about, you know, in, in the journey that you've been through. And I, I'm imagining, I'm going to channel the listeners of Amplifier Success because I, I imagine they're going to want the answers that I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. As you make a shift from significant income levels, from six to seven, from seven to eight, I believe there are um, pivotal moments something that you either decided or learned that changed, you know, or that helped you make that leap. And I would love to unpack that if you don't mind. Like, what do you mm -hmm. think was the shift that made it possible to go from six to seven figures, first of all? Six to seven figures, I had to, I think one of the things that happens for us when we're highly competent is that because we're so competent, it doesn't occur to us to delegate. And, and entangled in that also was, is someone going to do this the way I want? And are we going to have, like, I was raised in a house with broken promises. Now I don't say that from a victim stance. I just know how much these things impact our ability to make money and grow and so on. So I was used to broken promises from people that were supposed to support me. So I just had this unconscious expectation. And so as we know, like we're always going to bottleneck when we don't call in enough support. So part of it was, well, hire, like I do think you can get to seven figures without any team, but I think that's going to be a very tiring road. 
most of us in a service-based business, I think, can get to about 250K with burnout. <laughs> burnout will be a side effect. We can get there. But, um, but then we realize, okay, this is going to really uh, be an issue. And then I had to, I think the, you know, once I crossed over, well, then when I would get to about 500K, I thought, okay, well, why, I don't need any more money. I have, live a simple life. I only really need to make 5K a month to live comfortably. So why am I going to keep doing this? I felt like I was working way too hard to get there and I didn't need to. But then I had to check myself and say, okay, well, none of this is about need. This is about desire. This is about serving. This is about impact. So if I take need out of the equation and I don't need to make this, then let me reevaluate why I would allow myself to call in seven figures. What am I going to do with that money? So the cool thing about that is that all of a sudden I was guided to learn how to create my own brokerage account, right? To, to be in control of my money and find a home for my money and let it compound essentially and let the garden grow, so to speak, and let the garden cross pollinate. Then I was guided to go into real estate just to learn more about money and compounding money and really learn this thing about, I don't have to be the sole source of generating my income. Like I can send my money to work for me, right? And I think that's part of what got me to seven figures but uh, I think that happens for a lot of us. By the time we get to mid six figures, we've learned the art of the ask. We, if we look at the money receiving sequence, we've, we've learned the art of the ask. We've learned how to receive it. What we struggle with is holding it. We can either feel guilty about it, for sure, with me as a healer. There's all kinds of judgments around, um, you know, me being all about the money or me being selfish or me being less spiritual because I'm actually growing a company that, I don't know, employs people and, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Right. And, um, and so that was all tied in there as well. And then I would say within that journey as well, I had to realize, oh, I'm not a coach. I'm basically, well, I'm not a healer. I'm, I have a healing school. I, I'm the CEO of a training school. And so once I could treat it like a proper business instead of it's all about me, not that it was ego, but I mean like people not paying me wasn't personal. That's just something that companies deal with or people ghosting on a sales call. That's not personal. That's just part of running a company, right? So it allowed me to not make things personal. It allowed me to make better business decisions and see things from a 360 vantage point that then allowed me to see the seven figure opportunities that I wouldn't have seen if I still felt like every month had to start with how many clients do I need to onboard this month in order to hit my goal and, you know, this hamster wheel that we can get on. Mm. So well said. Oh, you said so many things there that were gems. A couple that I just want to circle back to, and uh, there's a segue here, <laughs> but, um, you know, this it's almost like by focusing on impact, like wh what, it, what is it that I want to do and realizing we can remove ourselves as the sole wealth creator, right? And like that our money can start to work for us on behalf of us. Like that is mm -hmm. so powerful. And I, I, I know you do a lot with prosperity codes, so I, I, we're going to have to come back to that in a minute. One of the things that I, I think you were talking about, um, that where people bottleneck and get stuck right around 500,000, sometimes around 250 is they recognize they have to invest in their business, mm -hmm. but there's this slippery slope between going into debt and overextending yourself and investing in the expansion of your company. And I'm wondering if you could uh, maybe unpack that a little bit with me and talk about your own experience with that and maybe how you navigated that. Mm. I, okay. So when I uh, first started my business, the very first year, I went from feeling like I was working for pennies an hour to all of a sudden I had a waiting list in three months. Cause I started smartening up and just really working with energy and, you know, getting out of my own way and just realizing I have to detach from what will people think of me, especially my old career, right? Will they run into me at these psychic fairs and think I'm a total wackadoodle? Well, maybe they will, and that'll be okay. I don't need them to like me. They're not my clients anyways. That's not who I'm speaking to. I can, I can give myself permission for people to 
be, you know, because there's a polarity, right, of people really thinking you're a wackadoo and then people being way too clingy and putting you on a pedestal and, of course, everything in between, right? So I can be okay regardless of how people feel about me because I know my heart and I know what I'm here to create, right? So that freed me up. Point is, I ended up scaling to six figures very quickly and that was before um, social media existed. That was when websites, my first website was digital, meaning like they would take a picture of my copy and upload it to the website. So if you had a spelling error in there or you had classes and you wanted to change dates, you always had to go to your web designer, right? To change the date, they'd have to retake, you know, the pic and upload it to the website and stuff. So I grew my business through speaking gigs and networking groups and stuff back then. And anyways, that first year I was just ridiculous I I had no concept of time I didn't block out anything for meals working out social time anything I was seeing people in all different time zones around the world and and then I started getting resentful and it felt weird why do I love what I do but why do I really not like my business right now and why do I love my clients but then why do I also you know not want to talk to anyone I didn't like that feeling and so out of the blue this synchronistic event which of course is the case right I got this email uh, but from this woman who was teaching people how to bring things online I was not online I was not actively list building hey if you want me to email you stuff let me know right I had a list of 650 people and those were all paying clients I did not at all grow my email list and uh, so I felt like I was getting a PhD in online marketing, but the point is I knew I needed to do that because I could see where I was bottlenecked and I was working way too hard to make, let's say a hundred to 150 K a year. Like it's just not sustainable to have a call me when you need me business model. I was charging a hundred bucks an hour for readings, you know, teaching classes on the weekends, seven days a week. I was just always going. And, um, and so the fun thing about that was that although it, I mean, coming online was, was a thing all the lingo i had to learn about lead magnets and freebies and e-zines and teleseminars and the technology oh my goodness i'm such a tech a phobe right so there was so much growth but the point is is that i was really burnt out i decided that was not sustainable it was starting to feel like i was back in forensics where i was living for the weekends and super burnt out and stuff and that was not what i wanted to create so i uh i hired this woman and I had $17,000 in the bank in savings. That was my security blanket. And her coaching program was $17,000. And I call it the gulp factor because I was like, I know I need to do this, but holy crapola. This is literally taking away my security blanket. I'm going to have to get serious about this. I'm going to have to do everything she tells me to do. I have to really trust that this is the right person. And I did, and I quadrupled my income very quickly. And I went to one of the masterminds and every I was standing in front of the room and people were exceptionally rude to me, like really mean. I have no, you know, how am I supposed to respect you as a healer when you're only charging $100 an hour? And I'm not surprised that client attraction isn't as easy for you as it could be because I can't take you seriously unless you're charging 200 and whatever. And... Uh, and all of those people, every single one of them approached me as soon as I finished my mastermind hot seat. And they're like, hey, can I book a reading with you um, this <laughs> weekend for your old rate before you raise your rates? And, uh, and I thought that was interesting. So I agreed to it. And this one woman ghosted me. And she's like, oh, it just didn't work for me. Maybe you could come to. And so this was when I was in the servitude energy, right? Of like, oh, no, let me make it super easy for you. And um, and there was something about that which I needed. I was so grateful for that because I got mad. But that good kind of mad where you're like, I'm done. And, that, and it was a pattern interrupt, right? So I said, well, um, you're welcome. I'm going to be heading home now. I need to go to the airport. You're welcome to book with me. But my new rate is 250 and you're the one that coached me on that. And I said it nicely, right? But if you want to book, great. And all of them actually booked with me at that new rate. But then I leapt into this because that's all I knew, a 17K package. But that investment, right? I call it the gulp factor because I do think that I, we see it a lot in the coaching industry where sadly people are going into sizable debt. Sizable debt. 
to work with coaches, not because and it's not even the coach is bad. It's just that people aren't tuning into what they really need or they don't ask the right questions or they just don't the right research or whatever. Additionally, like if you want to be seduced into a bright, shiny object, there's a lot of copy out there that's going to seduce you, but there's going to be no substance in a, in a container that seduces you into it. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, what am I actually getting? What results are being promised? That kind of thing. So point is, is that it's not that I went into debt, obviously, but I had no security blanket, but it forced me to get real with myself and say, is this really a priority? Like, are you really done with this pattern? Are you willing to be all in? And so I was used to, by the time I hit 500K, I was used to making constant investments in myself. I didn't go into debt from the 500K, but there certainly have been stretchy moments. And I know we've all made bad investments too, where we're like, oh uh, yeah, I should have asked better questions or I didn't honor my intuition. And I wish I had of, you know, done things differently. I don't know that we need to go into debt to get it to seven, seven figures. I didn't, but it certainly... It changes when you have to start bringing on new team members and especially highly qualified team members. Like once I brought on a COO, like that's a different investment, right? And so then I have to be mindful of, okay, well, I, I team members aren't necessarily there to make me money, but they give me back my time in order for me to make more money. And so many people don't do that. They think, oh, I, I've hired my VA. How come I'm not making more money? Or how come I had to let my VA go? Well, they're focusing on low dividend stuff so you can focus on high dividend stuff if you're not going to focus on the high dividend stuff yeah like you're not going to be making money from that you're going to be making money from the time that you get back right so i had to just make sure that the recurring revenue ecosystem that i created was gonna i had to know what my monthly costs were going to be right so that i could of course pay everyone i always pay people and um and look at the smart investments so anything i did after that was always about what investments are really going to grow the company and grow the company quickly. I'm not like you, Melanie. I don't like to wait around forever. Like if, if once I've decided I want results, I'm like, okay, today is still too late. Like this could have happened yesterday sort of thing. Right. So. I think you really, you said what I was, was hoping would emerge yeah. from the conversation. And that is there's a difference between going into debt and being intentional investing in growth. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea of the gold factor is just perfect. So well done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's true. Like a, a, just because you're gulping doesn't mean it's a bad investment and really like understanding what's aligned for you is important. Yeah. So uh, I just want to take this one step deeper before I move on. You know, we talked about the six to seven figures and then you went seven to eight. Mm -hmm. Was there anything specific to the seven to eight leap that's worth mentioning here? I'm sure there's a ton of it. Uh, well, I had to get really clear on, okay, so the outer things are, and obviously I have an asset, the certification program is an asset. I'm not trying to get everyone to be like me. I'm a big believer in creating an asset. It may be a certification program. It may be something that you create that you're licensing or something, but something that can exist whether or not you are doing it, right? Like can someone else come in and buy your company and still make money from the IP that you've created, right? And so in my case, that's that's the case, right? It's very established. We now have a full teacher program. Like I, I haven't taught a class in, I don't know, probably 15 years, I'm gonna guess, right? I teach my teachers, but I don't I don't teach um, the kind of the, you know, entry level stuff. I'm not above it. It's just, you know, it just is what it is now. So uh, I would say that, and I had, well, yeah, I had to just look at, Okay, here's, you know, here's what it is. I think even once we get to seven figures, we still operate from our zone of competence instead of our zone of genius. And I still do this now. I had to get really honest with myself and be like, okay, you think that that zone of genius, but actually that can be delegated. So I had to really be honest and I still do this. Is this me? It's my job, all of our jobs as the CEO is to be the face of our company. And only we can be the face of the company. And I'm talking for high profile things. Of course, we can send a joint venture manager to go and broker deals for us or, you know, have a team member do interviews and stuff. But I'm talking about when you're doing TV or you're doing podcasts or whatever, only you can be the face of your company. So that means I have to allow time for that. I have to create the vision and communicate the vision and make sure the vision's coming to life through the delegation. 
and uh, and that's that's basically it, right? Oh, and sorry, relationship building. We have to, you know, I think I think the the leap from seven to eight figures is always going to help your company to do this. But power of proximity and really focusing on on uh, strategic relationship building, I think, is is helpful, right? So building the company as though you're going to sell it, even if you never have a plan to sell it, can it survive? I mean, even just if we look at what happened in 2020, the amount of people that sadly went from 100K months to zero months because they they kept waiting to start that additional revenue stream. Or, you know, I, I had a lot of clients that had in-person offices and stuff, let's say naturopaths and acupuncturists and stuff that were doing really well, but all of a sudden their doors had to close and that those digital assets that they kept saying they were gonna do, you know, they didn't, they were never enough of a priority. And then, you know, at least they had the space to create them and they did scale back up pretty quickly, but it was, it was a big hit and very stressful for people. So of course we don't, you know, we're not always going to be going through that, but that hopefully was a great reminder for people that we need to, is the company healthy? Can the company survive if we have to take a six month hiatus? It, you know, can it, is it sellable if all of a sudden I have to step away from the company or I just decide I don't want it anymore? I'm not mm. planning to sell my company, but I at least build out the assets and kind of build the structure in a way that it can exist without me. Oh, so smart. Wow. So many gems in there mm -hmm. that um, I, I just, I think as you're listening in, you're probably going to want to listen to this three or four times because I have a feeling you're going to hear what Jennifer just said differently as you grow and evolve and maybe even start implementing some of the things we've talked about here. Um, Jennifer, I I want to I want to learn more about what you call a prosperity code, mm -hmm. and I know you have a resource that we can share with everybody in a second around that. But I'm just curious, you know, in terms of the success you have and the success you're witnessing and the people that go through your programs, how important is it for people to understand their prosperity code? And maybe I don't know, maybe there's a piece that has to shift for them to really unleash the the flow of prosperity in their life mm -hmm. i love that question yeah it's so you know all these years i was guided to talk about wealth consciousness and stuff it was only in 2020 when i was like what is happening in the world and i need to help people there's so many people that need support right now i had so many people reaching out i wanted to know what am i actually coded for like what am i really supposed to focus my energy on right now and what can i step back from and so in my chart, unbeknownst to me, which I should have known, was that I'm here to elevate wealth consciousness. And there's many layers to that. But all this time I had been teaching that and wondering why. Why am I teaching this? Like I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching, you know, spiritual consciousness. And it's not like I didn't know this, but at that time I thought, of course, like we can't be saying we're elevating consciousness and then bypass wealth consciousness. It doesn't work that way right? It's all consciousness. So we're either elevating consciousness or we're not. And not that I like to be black and white, but I mean, in that situation, it kind of is, right? And so part of it ties into what am I coded for? We have a, a whole life path or we have a whole soul blueprint for this lifetime, but the prosperity codes I'm talking about are now what? In a post-2020 world, what are we coded for? What's the role we're meant to play in this new world that we're living in? beyond kind of the overarching themes of our, our whole lifetime, right? And so I'm not meant to be a part of the old world. I can be witness to it and I can get it because we're all navigating, we're all straddling, straddling these this paradox of we still kind of have a foot in the old world, it's not fully dismantled, but this new world isn't created. But I'm specifically coded as are many of us to help us all get over this bridge, right? Whereas other people are here to help people, um, you know, deal with the the fallout of all of the dismantling and, and, and everything in between, right? And some of some people are gonna be coded to really offer sort of 3D services, let's get you into your body or let's make sure you're fed or let's make sure, you know, whatever. And others of us are meant to be channeling or transmitting new healing technology, so to speak, or whatever. And so it's it's important. I mean, we can do that in the Akashic Records, of course. There's there's a lot of places to find that out, right? I think even human design and astrology and gene keys and things like that can help people get a little more clear on that. 
but the in that we're all in an ascension journey whether we realize it or not and um even if we look at people and we think oh they just are not intuitive at all they just go through life like none of us are on the, the, the frequency on this planet right now is so strong unless our souls are really old and have been already calibrated to really potent frequencies we just wouldn't be able to be on this planet it would be impossible to come here because we have to deal with energetic resonance right and and people's bodies would literally like implode on them essentially right because they need to be able to hold more light so even people that we can look at and say oh they just seem to kind of go through life on autopilot we're all here at this time for a reason and so the more we tune into that but the codes are changing right so for example consciousness is the new currency more and more people are investing in it more and more people are using that as the starting point for manifestation so in the old world we used to do in order we start we started the manifestation proce process through doing i'm doing then i'm being this identity I'm being a banker, I'm being a healer, I'm being a coach, I'm being whatever. And because of what I did and who I became, I now have. But the new way of creating prosperity starts with I be. I be the frequency. I calibrate to the frequency of what I want to create. That then leads to inspired action. Not doing, but inspired action. Same thing, different, different vibe. And then I have. Right? And so in that, we're working a lot more with consciousness, but more people are selling consciousness, more and more, um, like the greater percentage of the population is recognizing that they need to invest in consciousness. And then within that, you know, we're all coded to make money a certain way. So like I said, I'm here to elevate wealth consciousness. So when I focus on that, I do well, not because I'm trying to make money from it, but because I'm living in alignment with my coding. As right now, we've just stepped into a three-year cycle of spiritual maturation, which is also spiritual mastery. And that means that this is the year where if we're not in alignment, the universe is going to get us into alignment. And that might look like a universal two by four for some people. And that might look like little tiny tweaks, right? I know I'll be tweaked. I don't think any of us have 100% alignment ever. I think that would be you know, pretty arrogant to think that. But for those of us that are really deciding to be aligned and to keep you know, stretching and being clear and living in the awe and wonder and living in the curiosity and being open to getting the downloads, we're going to have a far less bumpy ride. But for people that choose to resist it, it's almost like a universal law. It's going to move us towards alignment, whether we like it or not. And it could, it's either going to feel like um, we're baptizing kittens or it's going to feel like, you know, a nice smooth chocolate sauce ride on a river and a boat and, you know, coasting. So I'm going to, I'm going to claim the chocolate way. sauce, by the way. Totally. Yeah. We can feel that right in our body when <laughs> things are nice and smooth. So it's a little bit, I mean, there's a lot to it, but there's certain, there's new, just like, uh, people will be tasked with downloading the new business templates. And Melanie, I'm sure you're one of those people because you're always plugged into that world, right? Of like, how are we doing business now? The way we used to do business pre 2020 I mean, even by the time we got to 2019, I think most of us were kind of sick of some of the marketing tactics, right? But there's literally no room for those now. We're already seeing it. We're just seeing the transformation in front of our eyes. So some of us will be tasked with bringing through the new business templates and kind of setting the tone and kind of taking the lead in saying, okay, everyone, in the spirit of consciousness and evolving humanity, this is how we're going to do business now. And some of us will be downloading the templates for how we navigate our body right there's so many rules out there about how we're supposed to feed our body and how many hours in between we're supposed to leave to you know lose weight and like all of the things right all the old paradigm stuff there's going to be new relationship templates and some people will just be calling forward new ways to build friendships or new ways to be in romantic partnership and then some of us will be bringing forward like new prosperity codes essentially right so it's like i said it's a little more complicated but um i'm excited and and it's new right like it's we like new but it's also there's no reference points so it's cool to create when there's no reference points, but it's also a little bit wobbly when we're like, I don't know how to do this. Is there no model or blueprint to follow? What's going on? We have to really just tune into our intuition when we're in this, this new world, right? 
Yeah. And it's a little bit of the wild west, you know, when you're totally. kind of navigating everything in this crazy, like, you know, there's no lines to point as we're going the right direction. So I, I love that you brought the intuition in. So since we're on this subject of the prosperity codes, I know you have a resource around this. Could we just let people know where they could find that? Um, because yes. I'm sure everybody's like, okay, what's my prosperity code? How do I know what it is? Yeah. Well, I've created, I mean, it's, it's kind of a quiz slash assessment, right? And it's called the new earth prosperity code. So the whole point of that is to get clear on where am I now? Like, what am I now being called into that? I wasn't in a pre 2020 world. What, what's being asked of me? What's going to need, where am I, how close am I to really being alignment with my prosperity codes and what needs to be calibrated in me or, or based on what I answer, you know, what what's the best way to focus my energy right now what's the best way to focus my tasks so um people that's a free resource and you can go to souljourneys.ca forward slash prosperity codes and that will take you to the assessment which is free and you can find out and we we give you a very comprehensive report so you're not just left going oh here's my archetype and that's it and i i you know don't know anything else uh, great. Uh, we will link that up in the show notes and uh, I, I'm going to do it because I, I'm now super curious. Uh -huh. um, you've painted such an extraordinary picture of this fine tuning. And I think this could be a great asset to help with that process. Okay. So uh, souljourneys.ca slash prosperity codes to download that. And again, we'll link that up for you. So Jennifer, we've covered so much ground and I think um, there's so many things I would want to ask you, but just for the sake of time, I want to ask you a fun question as we wrap up. <laughs> um, I think you've done a lot of bold things and made a lot of bold moves and taken a lot of bold action. What would you say is the boldest thing you've done up to now to be oh. able to amplify the reach of your work in the world? The short version, sorry, just for sake of time. <laughs> Uh, well, I would say, you know, I invest multiple six figures in myself every year. That's pretty bold. And it's not to say that I'm wonderful. That's just, it's, I'm growth minded. Mm -hmm. I think that can feel like a bold move. But even as you asked me, I thought, you know what? It's, it's the things that I actually said no to yeah. that might have left people feeling like I was being a big B because I didn't want to participate in their thing. And it wouldn't have been that. It's literally just, does this feel aligned? Is this a priority? Do I have space for this? Can I really honor this? And, uh, or, or even like I'm a zigger when everyone else is a zagger. So I'm not going to be part of the cool kids club. I purposely don't participate in the cool kids club. I actually try to cross pollinate with a ton of other um, different types of business models and go to things that, you know, and I love the online world, don't get me wrong. And there's a lot of amazing people in it, but I don't need to constantly be in that fishbowl, right? I want to be constantly cross-pollinating. So I've been given many opportunities to compromise my integrity so that I can be seen on the same stages as certain people, because that's going to make me look good or because, um, you know, that's what everyone else is doing, or that's supposed to be the pinnacle of success. But if it really felt misaligned or I just felt like, and you get this, Melanie, because you're a 6'2". Yeah. As a 6'2 generator, I have a high standard of integrity and I love my community. I am not ever going to introduce them to someone that I can't personally refer my business to. Doesn't mean I will refer it, but it just means that I'm even more protective of my clients than I am of myself. So if I can't refer my business to them, then I'm definitely not introducing them to my community. And that's not a popular opinion because of course I could have had maybe, you know, 10,000 new email subscribers every time I compromised my integrity and was linking arms with people on a stage that felt gross to me. But why? I'd rather spend $10,000 getting 10,000 qualified leads from a Facebook ad, right? <laughs> Not that I'm even doing that, but you get what I'm saying instead of um, doing that. And so it's not to knock people that do that. I do understand that, of course, there's a value to borrowing other people's stages, so to speak. And there's certain things that we do for authority positioning and stuff. But I do draw the line at feeling like I need to take, like doing things that make me want to have to take a shower after. There's a difference between amplifying with alignment and amplifying by sacrificing what feels aligned. 
And yes. I literally feel like you're channeling my brain as you answer that <laughs> question. So it was so profound for me to hear what I've said a million times come through your mouth. So of course, uh, and we're talking about 6-2 uh, generator, six, I'm a 6-2 manifester. We're talking about human design in case you're thinking, what is she talking about 6-2? Um, yes. Oh, just profoundly moved by that share. And I, I think what you hold space for, what you are a leader and a, and I think a, um, uh, a champion for that I also share is alignment. Hmm. And when we do things from the space of alignment, there's something so exquisite that, that, you know, when we're out of alignment or we're doing things that don't feel right, I actually said no to a whole bunch of things in January and February. And I didn't know why, because I was like, oh my gosh, I really want to be there. This is so what I want. And everything in my body was saying, no, don't be there. And I've had this experience my entire career. And sometimes it was like, nope, you're not working with that person. Nope, you're not going to that event. Nope, you're not going to like collaborate with them. And I never knew why, because it was like, oh my God, this is such a great opportunity. And I now know, and you know, saying no to those things at the beginning of years because there was a death in our family unit that I had to tend to and be present to. And if I had been gone at all these events, I would not have been able to be, you know, what I, doing what I need to do. And our 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 inner knowing, we know what feels aligned. And mm-hmm. I love that you're also, you know, sharing that this is this is the way to our prosperity. This is the way to abundance of all kinds. So Jennifer, thank you so much. You're thank such you. an extraordinary human. And I can't wait to, you know, dig deeper into all the gems that you bring to the world through your prosperity codes. And as you're listening in, if you have found this to be as inspiring and as moving as I have, I would love for you to share this episode with at least three friends who may want to unlock their prosperity code and maybe just need a little reinforcement to you know, really trust their intuition and amplify their genius in the world. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today, Amplifier. Be sure to join us right now in the Amplify Your Authority community at authorityamplifiers.com. And I'll share my seven proven tips to be a highly paid expert that stands out in a crowded market. Plus, we're going to keep this conversation going, and I want to hear from you how you're going to amplify your authority and make a greater impact. Before you go, please take a minute to give our show and our guests some love over on your favorite podcasting platform. Subscribe, rate, and review. Leave your full name, and I'll spotlight you and your authority on social media. 